want to welcome you to our Hollis Hammond's homecoming gallery talk. Um, it was sort of a homecoming because Hollis was one of my former students from um, long ago, and we've known each other for almost 27 plus years, so it's sort of like pretty amazing to be side by side tonight talking about her work. Um, she's a 1998 graduate of the visual arts program and has had several exhibitions in this region over the last 10, 15 years and exhibits globally, nationally, does lots of artists and residents. And so we're really happy that she could be here today and talk about her work and, and share her experiences um, from her travels of, around the world, schooling, all of that. So thank you, Hollis. Where I use 
one brush for the entire drawing. I was talking to the students earlier a lot about process, which is very fun. Um, so like, like looking at the hand of the artist is something that's always been important to me. Because um, again, I think that, that that hand is like my signature, <coughs> my story, like that autobiographical kind of thing um, that's embedded in all of my work. Pause. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I just talk without breathing. Um, so for this show, I, I, I did bring a lot of work. Um, originally, uh, honestly, David asked me if I could do half of the gallery because there was another thing planned um, at this time. Um, but a few weeks before I was to come here, he was like, I, now you can do the whole gallery. And so which was great, but I was like, okay, I don't have to dig up some other work, <laughs> things that I hadn't planned on sending. But it actually worked out better because um, I, I feel like this piece in particular, this, this actually represents literally the, the forest that was behind my parents' house, or my childhood home where, where I grew up. Um, it has text incorporated, it has this very fantasy quality, but it's, it's called the dark forest, so it has this little bit of a dark fairy tale quality as well. Um, it's all constructed from found imagery, but a lot of times what I do is I'll, um, I appropriate images and create photo collages that match my memory. So I, I rarely, not it's not completely true that I don't use photos of actual photos, but of places, but for this one in particular, I constructed a thing that felt authentic to me, like the true memory. And so I'm interested in that. I'm interested in this idea of collective consciousness, and some of you were here earlier, so I don't want to be super boring and say the same thing, <laughs> same things again, but um, there's something about sourcing America <laughs> and the Americana. I think of Americana as an idea that's very romantic and also out of date, right? And like my parents and grandparents' generation. And, but, there, but for me, there's definitely a romanticism in it. Um, but I like this gleaning of source imagery from others that then become a new thing that to me feels like the real thing. So I'm like remaking memory again through like imagery, basically. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just happy, because I could use the whole gallery and we could actually show this piece. Because it wasn't possible in the original plan. Um, and it kind of is, uh, sets up a background, like a theatrical background in a way as well, for the rest of the show. Um, one thing that did happen is that, um, these, and you guys can ask questions, we can talk about different ideas, but um, I brought all the drawings, unpacked everything, laid it out, I brought more work <laughs> than we needed, just to be sure. It's a pretty big space. Um, and then I, I knew for sure that I'd be making this installation in the back with the black and furniture. But I wasn't sure if there would be an additional piece. I had it in my mind that there probably would be. Um, but we set up the whole show, and it wasn't until like midweek that I was here that I was like, we have to have another piece. So a lot of times when I come to um, a space, I, I uh, purposely don't plan what a piece like this might be. I like to see what the space looks like and feels like, like how big it should be. I like to go around town and find objects. I'm really interested in the idea of objects as artifacts, right? So there's everyday objects. There's this sort of consumer's culture stuff. There's all the sort of Midwest aesthetic, which I think is like, like my parents collected all kinds of shit that, sorry, <laughs> that, that they stored in sheds and in basements and in rooms. And, um, you know, a lot of it was pretty useless, but um, there's something to that, like the stuff that we value, that we save, that we purchase, that's passed down through generations. Like, I'm interested in all those things. And then the idea of the object becoming artifact, 
meaning like we put our personal memory on, we embed it onto the object, right? And so then that becomes imbued with meaning. And um, although these are not objects that belong to me, they're completely just found. They are very specific to things that remind me of my childhood, remind me of my family, remind me of this place, like Kentucky. All these things um, have meaning for me. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> meaning for me in that way. Um, so, and a, a lot of my work is actually about um, sort of the, the evils of consumerist culture. Like a, a, lot, a lot, this show not in particular, but a lot of my work, if you look, is um, like piles of objects and piles of debris and landfills, just drawings filled with stuff. Um, but I think that these objects go both ways. It's like this, they have so much power, um, but they're also completely worthless. <laughs> so I, I don't know, I find that interesting. Um, I also have um, made a lot of work about disaster. So you'll see that there on the, in the back, well even on the sides here, are works that are like houses on fire. Um, there's a, a, a burning house with a video projection. There's images of fire and smoke. My house burned down when I was 15 years old. And um, I mean, this drawing we were talking about earlier, one of the students was asking, you know, what, where did this saying come from? Or what does this mean? Um, and I, t I was telling them it's kind of like my 15-year-old angst, you know, self. When my house burned down when I was 15, it was a very dark time for me. But this um, dramatic, like, um, like truly the piles of the black charred things were embedded in my memory, in my subconscious. I wasn't really that conscious that I was making work about it until someone eventually, like my sister, pointed it out to me <laughs> and said, oh, your work looks just like these photos you took of my house that burnt down. So, that, so that's what the drawing in the back of the room is. So this is different because these are actual photographs that I took as a 15 year old when my house burnt down. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, uh, and I don't normally work directly from photos of actual locations, so this is so different for me. But, I, and, and much later than this work, but, but clearly related, right, to my story. So I, so I juxtapose these different things together. Um, there's a little bit of fantasy, a little bit of actual history, a little bit of invented memory. There's, um, these are completely illustrative, like invented drawings, like not using any source material. Um, there's a little bit of comics and uh, like image and text combinations. There's obviously this thing <laughs> in the center of the room, which can't really be ignored, but it's, um, for me, it is the most illustrative version. It's like a cartoon illustration of a concept, more so than I even think the drawings are. Um, so, <laughs> so, so now I'm like at a point where I, I don't know how much more to say, but maybe what we could do is like have a conversation or if people have questions, we could talk about ideas or technical things or whatever. Kevin. <laughs> so there's, it's weird because I, like when I go to my parents' house and stuff, there's lots of stuff. And yeah. you're, I've been in, the, I've been in forests like this where there's lots of stuff. Could you talk a little bit how you see space or how you see stuff? Like, it's almost like, space doesn't exist because it gets filled with stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah my, I mean, one of my other colleagues is, um, she's all about the picture plane, and I'm all about, like, like, there's no picture plane, right? It just keeps going on forever, and I often make a lot of work where it's just completely filled top to bottom. Although there are these landscape things happening in this particular show, right? Like scenes of landscape. But I don't, like, yeah, I mean, even this, this is the deep forest, but it's so flat, right? The flattening of the space, but also the window into the other. So I like that car sort of cartoon, you know, sort of flat fence or whatever that tells a thing, but then there's this psychological space beyond it that could be something else. So it's kind of teetering between
between right representational space and symbolic space. Um, and I, I don't really have rules about it. <laughs> it's just sort of like whatever feels right. Um, my images are pretty shallow though in general. Like, like even, even the technique, like the ink on the UPO, it just sits on the surface of the paper. We were talking about this earlier. Like it does not permeate the paper. It, it sticks to the paper, but it doesn't sink into the, to it. It's like so surface, but I love that. It's like very slick and plastic um, and fake. <laughs> There's something about the fake and fantasy that I like about it. <coughs> yeah. Um, there's language in a lot of your drawings. I was wondering if there were any specific linguistic inspirations, any literature that you read that inspired you, um, and inspired you for these pieces, especially like T.S. Eliot's Wasteland, mm -hmm. or the back piece, Wasteland? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I, I, well, and I do love that piece, Wasteland, and there's also, uh, completely unrelated, but there's a movie, Wasteland, a documentary about the landfills, right, um, <laughs> which is, which is, which definitely relates to my work. Um, I, have been really inspired by poets and, and some, you know, dark stuff. Sylvia Plath was always, you know, a little bit dark and tragic, my favorite. Um, <laughs> and I'm a little bit dark on the inside, I think. Although I, I think that I project a happiness on the outside <laughs> as a way to cope with reality and life and, and be functional in society. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing, I'm not saying. It is sort of a fake veneer that I created, but then it actually became my personality. So if you want to be happy, just pretend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's my, it's my <laughs> succinct version. I'm not a psychologist. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, the things that were really formative for me when I was a child were fairy tales, um, fables, and Bible stories. I'm actually an atheist, but I, went, I was a, you know, Bible school child, I went to church every Sunday, I always went, you know, to classes, I, I was well read, but I always saw those stories as metaphor and fiction, just like my fairy tale was as real to me as my Bible story. So um, those are the things that definitely influence me the most, and I don't know that my writing has anything to do with that, but... Of what fairy tales and folk stories? Like Little Red Riding Hood is like one of my favorite stories of all time. Like I've read like every version of it. <laughs> but you know, like the one where the wolf eats her. Um, <laughs> like the grim fairy tales. Um, food anxiety. Huh? It's food anxiety. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> I do have a lot of nightmares about I mean, they, they grew out of a whole cultural fear of oh, starvation. Yeah, of like not and I think that's why we still gravitate to them because I think we all wow, experience <laughs> that, that anxiety. Yeah. Particularly if you grew up with depression parents. Right. Which right. I did. Yeah. 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 It was very different. Yeah, my, I mean, I think the reason my parents were kind of hoarders. They weren't really. They were just like, they were living in the Cold War and they had grown up in the Depression. And so they had a lifestyle that was very much like conserving and saving everything. And everything had value, right? And, and you might need it, so save it. And nothing was thrown out, you know, it was always reused. So it's like pre-recycling, like before that was cool, you know, like depressionary era, families were doing that already. Um, also, like, being prepared for a disaster. <laughs> like, stockpiling yeah. is a thing. They wouldn't buy a lot of crazy stuff to stockpile, but they saved every single thing they had. But part, I mean, part of that is also economic stuff. I mean, they, they were poor. I didn't even know I was poor until, like, junior high school, then I started figuring it out. <laughs> I'd, like, go to my friend's houses and they have Oreos and name, <laughs> they have, like, name brand. They have, like, Chef Boyardee, I thought that was amazing. I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big deal back then. Mom, cookies. Um, yeah, wow. yeah, name brand cookies. But um, but I had an amazing childhood. It just was different than most of my friends because my parents were so much older. I was the baby. 
of the family. Yeah, okay, sorry, babbling. What else? Anything else? That's yeah. Picture 
even it's though great. it's on the surface. Of yeah, yeah, the that's that's great. Because I do I do feel that way as well. It's like a portal. Yeah. Right. The the flattening actually makes the the black deeper. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like that Klimt thing that just stick the gold leaf next to the yeah. flesh, and then it looks even more realistic. Right. All the art <laughs> students know what I'm talking about. Who are some of your artistic voices in, in languages or artists that you've admired through your career or are currently looking at that uh, either in, have influenced your work or you just like looking at, at, at their work? Yeah, I was just, t uh, I just gave a, a lecture to my freshmen. At, I teach in Austin, Texas um, at a university. And uh, it was this question. It was, I was this Putting, doing my formative works, like things that were really important to me, and I, I had a list of artists. So um, when I was growing up here, the Contemporary Art Center was in a different location. Everyone, some of you remember the old location, um, which was an amazing space. I thought I loved it because it was just like a giant white cube broken into some, some rooms, right? <laughs> and um, I saw the most amazing work there that, that really transformed my work, the way I think about being an artist. Um, the first was the Maplethorpe exhibit. I was a freshman in college, and we were out protesting <laughs> the censorship, you know, and the arrest of the director. And actually, um, Aaron Cohen, who runs the gallery at UC, I had been doing research, and I found a photo of him, like picketing, you know, <laughs> with, with like his 18-year-old uh, self. It was really cute um, <laughs> that I showed my students. Um, that was really transformative for me, if you guys don't know who that is. Um, he was a famous photographer um, who uh, had a show in Cincinnati that was super controversial, and it, it, there's a lot going around it, like censorship issues, the uh, funding for the arts, there's so many things. Um, so that really changed my awareness of what the art world was like. Um, so conceptually, it was important for me, like philosophically. And, and I had principled about what I thought was right, <laughs> and that censorship was bad. Um, then I saw the Kara Walker show. It's like, mm -hmm. and it was the time when she was just emerging, and people were like, oh, repulsed by her works. Like, like the black community even was like, oh, uh, like her father tells a story about how his friends were so offended by Kara Walker's works when she came out with those first few exhibits. And um, she had done one of those big rooms with all the silhouette, um, all the way around the room, like life-size silhouettes of, you know, kind of humorous and dark uh, Victorian era, like depictions of slaves and their owners and sexual things. Um, so that was really transformative for me. And then the other show that I saw there, which was a little bit later, was the Tim Hawkinson exhibit. Anybody? Yeah. Humunculus, 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 humunculus. Okay, I don't know. It's <laughs> the the one piece he had is like a latex bot. Like he put, put latex on his body and peeled it off and then made it a balloon. And it's on the cover of that Radiohead album. Is it Radiohead? <laughs> I don't know the album. Okay, I'm sorry. I, Beck, maybe it's Beck. Okay, I hope I'm I'm realizing it and it's being videotaped. Okay. Um, so we can look that up later. <laughs> anyway, so what happened, like he blew my mind because before that I thought, oh, I should, I'm going to be a painter. I'm going to make figurative work and, you know, this is my lane. And um, when I saw his show, it was, everything in the show was self-portrait. But there was a self-portrait made out of belts. There was a self-portrait made out of um, bubble wrap filled with pigment. There was a self-portrait made out of, like, where he laid in a bathtub and let the water drain and, and printed on paper. And there were these self-portrait drawings and self-portrait latex body that was an inflated balloon. And it was just the first time I had seen one single artist using all media, all of it, which is really what is standard now. Like, if you look at contemporary artists, like, so many of them are just multimedia artists. So the, so that's a really long answer, I'm so sorry. But um, those are my top three things. Other questions? <laughs> you know, any other questions? Perhaps you will be around
for a while. It's been a joyous food, and thank you, Molly.